because we've been keeping record of everything you've been doing, and we know exactly what it is. You know, there's going to be some little kid who gets a church outfit in Honduras because you put up the money for it, and it's going to look good, feel good, know the love of God, give their life to Jesus, become a pastor, and shape their community. You're never going to meet them. And then in heaven one day, they're going to be like, man, that's that outfit. And you think it's silly like that, but that's often, often the way it works. The way it works is we never know the thing that's going to make an impact and leave a mark and make a difference in the people around us. And, and, and we make a difference in different ways. And one of the ways we want to talk about is we want to talk about strengthening families today. That that's one of the things we want to do. We want to teach you how to strengthen your family. Now, now it's a little bit of muddy water because I have a fundamental philosophy. And most of you know this, but if you're new here, you've only been coming a little while, you might not know this. But my fundamental philosophy is biblical. The biblical terminology, it says that every human being has a sinful nature. The way I say it is everybody is jacked up. And if, if you don't think you jacked up, Survey the people around you, <laughs> and you might find out otherwise. Now, because we're all jacked up, most of us grew up in, in, in jacked up environments. Even when the environment looks healthy and good, we'll still end up in therapy because of it. You know, I'm trying to raise my kids in the ways of the Lord. My, uh, my oldest son wanted to get a little bit of help. He went to counseling. He was talking about some, some frustration and anger. The counselor was talking to him. He was explaining how I am. And the counselor told him, well, it sounds like your dad would benefit from some counseling too. <laughs> so e even when you're trying to do a good job, I'm like, bro, why am I in your counseling? Like, leave me out of this. That's you. You know, even when you're trying to do a good job, it, it's not easy, right? It's not easy. And even when we do our best, it doesn't mean that it's perfect, but, but you got to want to do your best. Now, now, before we get into this, I want to say a couple of things. Um, number one, um, Strong family is the backbone of the church and of community and of a world that honors God. It's incredibly important. Number two, many of you have non-traditional family environments. Some of you might not even have a lot of family. Some of you might not even have Family that's here. You might have moved here from another country and you look around and there's not a lot of family. Some of you, your family, your family's nuts. Some of you, you like, I don't want to deal with my family at all. I understand that too. But I want you to just stick with me and I want you to, to be honest and pray about what the Lord is speaking to you in this. Because maybe... God wants to work in your heart in this area, and you got to be open to the seed of the Word of God and what God's trying to give you and what God's trying to show you. Now, now I, I know that when you deal with crazy people, I know when you deal with crazy people, you got to have real strict boundaries sometimes, and sometimes you can only do so much, and that's okay too. I don't want you to hear anything in this sermon that's like I'm telling you, you gotta, you got to put yourself in a position that's going to hurt or injure you. Sometimes you have to have real strict boundaries. I understand that. At the same time, the third thing I want you to know is it's not too late. It's incredibly important. It's not too late for you to make an impact in your family situation. You might be 84 years old and sitting here today and go, man, it's, it's too late for me. No, no, it's never too late. It's never too late. There's two myths we often believe. We often believe that I got plenty of time when we're young. And then when we get old, we believe this myth of it's too late. It's never too late for you to give your life to the Lord, for you to follow his ways, for you to attempt to reconcile and minister to your family and to try to strengthen the family environment. And then here's the last thing about families. Your family is who God chose for you. And you got to come to terms with that. These are the people that God chose to put you with. And some of you are very blessed by that. Some of you have very blessed environments that you grew up in and the, the people that God has assigned to you. And others, you're like, man, it, this is a curse. It's not a curse. It's an assignment. And God has equipped and placed you here to hear this because you are exactly what that environment needs. I mean, if it's, it ain't going to be you, who's it going to be? If your whole family is full of insane people and you're the only sane one, then who else is going to minister to them? You at least 
God will put up with them because they're your family. Nobody else will probably even deal with them for very long because they crazy. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The, um, you know, Jesus was Jewish. And he grew up in a very Jewish environment. In the Jewish environment, Orthodox Judaism still today, very family-oriented. Very, very about the, the household that you raise up. And this passage we're going to read, Deuteronomy chapter 6, is the foundation of that. It's called the Shema. It's Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. But verse 1 says, These are the commands, decrees, and regulations that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you. You must obey them in the land you're about to enter and occupy. And you and your children and grandchildren must fear the Lord your God as long as you live. If you obey all his decrees and commands, you'll enjoy a long life. So listen closely. Be careful to obey. Then all will go well with you, and you'll have many children in the land that's flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. And then this is the Shema, verse 4. Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is the Lord alone. He is one. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength, and you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving to you today. Repeat them again and again to your children and talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road. When you're going to bed, when you're getting up, tie them to your hands, wear them on your forehead as reminders, write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. If uh, you've ever been into a, uh, like you've ever gone to Israel or you've been in a Jewish environment, you'll notice that the door will have a little scripture that's actually attached to it if you unrolled it. It's this verse right here because it says, man, attach this to your doorposts. And this is, this is kind of what we're talking about today. How do we, we strengthen our families? And I, I want to talk about this. The fir first thing it takes, if you're taking notes and writing, writing things down, is if you want to strengthen your family, then, then you've got to, to show them how you love the Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. How does your family see how you love the Lord? Um, there's very, I've been pastor for, for 23 years now. You, you learn some things over the years. I'm blown away at how many people give the Lord their Sunday best, but Monday through Saturday belongs to them. And this is very confusing when you're raising children because they have one parent Monday through Saturday and a totally different parent on Sunday. And a lot of people don't follow the Lord because of this reason. They saw their parents give the Lord the Sunday best, but Monday through Saturday, they were a whole different person. And that doesn't necessarily mean that they were wilding out. It just might mean that they were angry and bitter and difficult and authoritarian and and strict and, and overbearing and, and mean-spirited and critical and harsh and unforgiving. Man, they see somebody praising the Lord on Sunday, but then living like the devil Monday through Saturday. How many of you know that'll jack you up? That'll jack you up. Some of you, you've experienced that, and I'm sorry. But I've seen that. And then I've I seen another thing that's real weird to me. I've seen people do this. They go, I'm going to give the Lord my Monday through Saturday best, but then they don't go to church on Sunday. And the Lord don't get their Sunday best. That's confusing to your kids too. And you know what people will say to me? They'll say, well, you know, you could be a Christian and not go to church, which is technically true. That's technically true. But that don't make it a good idea. That don't make it a good idea. You can live in a crack house and not smoke crack. Right? That's possible. Is it a good idea? No. Because you know what happens? Your children don't develop the habit of going to church. And then when they turn 17, 18, 19 years old, I'm saying, you know, the proudest moment of me as, my dad, uh, as a dad is me and Dana were out of town on vacation. My kids were all home, which is okay. We're not going to go to hell for that. <laughs> you need to do that if you're married because you get your kids for a season and your spouse for a lifetime. Many of you treat your kids like you're going to have them for a lifetime and your spouse for a season, but that ain't the way the Bible calls it to be. One day they're supposed to leave. <laughs> and 
I got a text message, and it was somebody who was telling me how all of my kids were at church and we weren't there because that's their habit. They go to church even when we're not there, sit on the front row, praise the Lord, because I want them to have their own relationship with him. It's not enough to give just Monday through Saturday. They got to teach them how to, how to go to church. They got to see how you love the Lord. You got to give them your everyday best. They got to see how you love the Lord every day. They got to see how you pray. They got to see how you pray. No one can learn how to pray without hearing somebody else pray. They got to see how you pray. They got to see how you worship. How do you worship? How do, you, do they see you worship? They experience you worship. Do they get, get to see that? They got to they gotta see you fast. They got to see how you fast because that's one of the spiritual disciplines. They got to see how you attend church. They got to see how you prioritize that, how you make that important to you. They got to see what that, what that looks like, what that experience is like. I was talking to a group of kids in a, in a sound booth. Many of them go to Kenner Discovery well, friends go to Kenner Discovery School, and they had homecoming last night. And uh, Elam, who's in the back, he just walked in. What's up, Elam? Good to see you. I'll give it up for Elam. He's right back there. <laughs> Elam never went to sleep last night. That's what he told me. He said, I ain't slept yet. He went to homecoming. He said, man, how y'all signed me up to serve the day after homecoming? Yet Sunday morning, here he is. They got some grown person that watched the LSU game last night. Eyes cracked open this morning. He said, I can't do it. Hey, you got a teenager going, nah, man, Lord's, Lord's early. He was here early, too. He was here real early. Man, they got to see how you attend church. They got to see how you serve. They got to see how you serve. You going to buy one of these Honduras gifts? We'll do Operation Christmas Child, which is the shoe boxes in the month of November. We'll do Angel Tree, which will be somebody local in December. You should do all three of them, and you should take your kids with you to do them. And if you ain't got kids, find a kid to take with you. <laughs> I'm being for real. Because there's some kid in your neighborhood, hey, bro, you come with me. Let, me. let me snatch you up. Talk to their mama. Can I take him for an hour to go buy a kid a gift in Honduras? The mom will be like, yes, please. <laughs> She'll be like, what's your name? Never mind. It doesn't matter. <laughs> take them, please. I've been praying and fasting for this. <laughs> go bring them with you. Pick, pick it up. We, we got to pick church clothes for a six-year-old girl, and you're going to help me do it. They got to see your generosity. They got to see what that looks like. They got to see your, your service. How do you, how do you commit? They got to see your joy. They got to see how you love the Lord because that's important to them. If they don't ever see it, then they can't do it and carry it out. The first thing they got to do is they got to see how you love the Lord. Here's the second thing. If you want to strengthen your family, then you got to live by God's word. You got to live by God's word. Deuteronomy 6, 8, you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to the commands that I'm giving to you today. You got to come to church so you can hear the word. You got to come to church so you can hear the word. You got to read the word. You got to study the word. You got to meditate and marinate on the word, and you got to obey the word. And your children got to see this because God's word becomes a cornerstone, a keystone, a baseline, the thing that we're comparing ourselves to. We as Christians should compare ourselves, but not to one another. We should compare ourselves to the word of God. That's what we should do. We should use God's word as a standard, a plumb line, a baseline, the thing that we look. You know the word command is the word prescription. Prescription. Let's say prescription together on three. One, two, three. Prescription. Prescription means to write down beforehand. Prescript. To write down beforehand. The word goes first before. And then we compare what we've done to it because it preceded us and it goes above us and before us to evaluate and look at how we're living our lives. Joshua 1.8 says, study the book of the law continually, meditate on it day and night so that you may be sure to obey all that's written in it. Only then will you succeed. You got to live by God's word. You got to teach them God's will. You got to teach them God's will. Deuteronomy 6, repeat, 
the commands again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road and when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and your gates. You can't teach your children God's word, God's will, God's ways unless you know them. You got to understand what it is that God wants you to do. Proverbs 12, 26, the godly give good advice to their friends. I got a, a news flash for you. If we don't talk to our families and our children about their spiritual beliefs and values, then they're going to learn them from school, their friends, and YouTube. I'm going to tell you right now, TikTok is educating your children in 30-second and 60-second bits. That's how they're getting educated. You have to, to teach them. You got to say, man, let's talk about spiritual things. Let's have a conversation about what God wants you to do. I've got certain things that, that, that we do. We, we, we got rules for our kids. I won't give my children a cell phone before the seventh grade. Now, does that make me strict? Yes or no? Now, according to my children, does that make me strict? What age are most people giving their kids cell phones? It ain't the seventh grade. My kids look like the Amish going to school. <laughs> Yesterday, I picked up my youngest son, Sammy, from a friend's house. They live in our neighborhood. He was telling me how they had walked the dog. I said, oh, so you'll walk his dog, but you won't walk our dog. And he said, well, I can't walk our dog. I said, why? He said, because I don't have a cell phone. <laughs> I said, what you need a cell phone to walk the dog? He said, what if somebody kidnaps me? And then he said this, so what you need to do is ask yourself. <laughs> it's a real conversation. He's in the backseat. What you need to do is ask yourself. Because if you give me a cell phone, then I could walk the dog. Now, how many of you know I went out and bought a cell phone? No, I didn't do that. We got a rule for our kids. They, they can't date anybody until they're 16. Why is that? Because I want them to remain pure before they're married. And if you start dating somebody at 13, by the time you're 18, y'all been seeing each other for five years. You're going to run out of stuff to do. It's math. It's just math. And I'm okay. I'm okay with my kids getting married young. I'm okay with that because I want them to be pure when they get married. And I know for them to stay pure until they're 32 is going to be real hard. <laughs> Amen? I'm okay with that. You got to have rules. You got to teach them God's will. These are not things that I'm coming up with. This is because I want them to walk in God's ways. And as a parent, you got to look at those things and go, man, what does that look like? And how does that function? And how does that operate? And that don't mean it's always easy for them, but it's our responsibility to teach them. Children need to be instructed. I want to I'm going to tell you something. Kids are stupid. Am I the only one that has kids? Has anybody been around children? They do very, very foolish things. And you might think, Pastor, you can't say that about kids. Well, I just did, so what you going to do? <laughs> I'm raising them, and I know that they need instruction, and I want to help you out. Parents are stupid too. <laughs> they are. Which is why you need God's word and God's will and God's ways to teach you how to do this. Do you know it says this in the Bible? It says, you know, we used to live in a day and time. Y'all all grew up. You grew up under a time when it was culturally appropriate to discipline your children. Can I get an amen? How many of you had the foolishness beat out of you? I'm talking about like, you know, I mean, my dad punched me in the chest one time. Boom. 
because I spoke disrespectfully to my mother when I was 16. I went to Brother Martin 11th grade crying. Now today, he would go to prison for that. But here's the problem. The Bible says a person who doesn't discipline their child doesn't love them. There needs to be some discipline. Now, does that mean you should punch them in the chest? No. My parents were drug addicts. Remember this. <laughs> I was, I was, that's why you need God's word because God's word has to, there should be a, a center balance, a center point. And we got we to figure out what that is. And you got to figure out what discipline looks like. And it looks different for different people. You know, my oldest son, Jack Hayden, he's, he's 20, 20 years old now. <clears throat> Are you 20? Are you? He, he's 19. He's about to be 20. Once you're in the year that you turn 20, you're 20 to me. He's 19. You know, when he was in, we were talking about this because, because my, Sammy's in the f- uh, fifth grade right now, and he decided, you know, in the fifth grade, you get real grades. That's when real grades show up. And Sammy decided not to do five homework assignments. And he got zeros. And so I had to have this conversation with him. I said, well, man, how many zeros do you think you can get? And he said, five. (laughs) So we had to do the math to show him the impact of five zeros versus five fifties. Right? Right? Well, this is what five zeros looks like. And at the end of it, he's like, man, I didn't realize that. I was thinking about Jack Hayden being in the fifth grade. He got, uh, he got in trouble for missing three homework assignments in a row, but then he didn't tell us that he got in trouble. So he had a detention that he didn't show up for. And he thought, because he in the fifth grade, I'm just going to skate by this. And then we found out, and he got in all kind of trouble. So we had to discipline him. So how do you discipline a fifth grader? Well, he was always into clothes. Like, they were important to him. Like, he would get... He would get home from school when he was a little baby, two, three years old, and immediately he wanted to put his night clothes on. What you call them, pajamas? We call them night clothes. And he put night clothes. I want the night clothes on. And we learned early when he was little, the way we punched him was like, no night clothes. And he'd freak out, no! You got to go to sleep in your clothes for tomorrow. It was like kryptonite. So he's in the fifth grade. We got to discipline him. So what do we do? Do we beat him? Some people are like, yes, you choke him to death. At the last breath, you let go. No. No, you got to get creative. You got to pray about it. Lord, what do you want us to do? So we got a creative solution. He, at the time, flag football, NFL play 60, E. Cole Classic was a popping place. 500 kids playing flag football. We about to go out there with Preston, go out there and play. So, buddy, since you don't want to do your schoolwork during the week, you get to do it on the weekend. So today, all day on Saturday, you get to wear your school clothes. Full uniform. Belt, socks, shoes, name badge, the whole nine. You got to go out to eat cold class eat, looking like a fool. And everybody's like, man, what's wrong with you? Why are you in your school clothes? <laughs> man, you know, I didn't do my homework. You know, man. <laughs> Pop's tripping, you know. <laughs> Guess what? Guess what? Homework assignment's done. Now, guess what? Let's say it didn't work. Ada did something else. And that thing wouldn't work with Sammy. Sammy's 10. He gets home from school. Jack Hayden, am I lying? This dude don't take his school clothes off. He will go to sleep on a Friday night still in the school uniform. Socks, drawers, shoes, everything. I'm like, bro, take your school clothes off. Won't do it. You got to figure out what it is. You know, if I was raising Cohen, who's not here, you got to worry for a second, didn't you? I got twin nephews. One of them sitting in here, but it ain't Cohen. It's Keegan. If if I was parenting Cohen, I'd go, hey, man, no more accessories because this dude loves his accessories. He's got on six wristbands right now, two ankle bracelets, three chains. You lost all your accessories. No! You got to figure out what it is for each kid, but you got to teach them and instruct them is your responsibility. And if you ain't got kids, that don't mean you scot free. That kid up the street, your grandchild, your nephew, your niece, the other people that are in your life, and we all got responsibilities in this. Here's number four. We got to set a good example. 
Our children are constantly watching us and molding their lives after our example. 1 Kings 15, Nadab did what was evil in the Lord's sight, and he followed the example of his father, continuing the sins that Jeroboam did that led Israel to commit. 2 Chronicles 17, the Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he followed the example of his father's earthly years and did not worship the images of Baal. Listen to this quote. Don't worry that your children never listen to you. Worry that they're always watching you. You've heard this before. Don't do what I do. Do what I say. Don't work that way. Don't work that way. They copy. They copy. And what's worse, not only do they copy, they usually exaggerate it. They usually go a little bit further than you do. You got to figure that out. The word example is the word tupos. In Greek, it's T-Y-P-O-S. It's where we get the word typo from or typewriter. Remember old school typewriter? How many of y'all learn how to type on a typewriter with a ribbon? Kids, y'all don't know nothing about this. The letter would be on a little arm. It'd be like the letter B. And you hit B, the B would come up, and it would strike the paper, and it would leave the indentation of a B. And it was a little ribbon with ink on it and would fill that little hole with ink. And if the ribbon was out, it would leave the imprint but not the ink. That's your life. Your life is an imprint on your children. Now, I don't want you to raise your hands. I want you to raise your hands. But if your life has been imprinted by your parents, think about that. You know, I come, um, I come from a long history of... of the Miller family, everybody's angry and frustrated. Everybody. Everybody. I, the last time I talked about this in church was about a month and a half ago. My Uncle Billy, who lives in Slidell, texted me after the service and said, I still got it. He said, I'm in trouble today because of what I did during the LSU game yesterday. Long history of angry people. And it left an imprint on me. And now, my son, he, he got that. He's dealing with that. It's in the DNA. We like a hunting dog. Just It's in the, in the genes. It's in the genes. It's in the blood. You got stuff in your blood, and you got stuff that's imprinted on you. You got to then think, how's your life imprinting your children? How's it imprinting them? And remember, I told you it ain't too late. It's never too late to change. I need my children to see the second half of their life be parenting them as a much calmer version than I've been. I get worked up too easy. Anybody here you get worked up too easy? Too easy? I, I need my children to see me calmer. Now, some of you, you too calm. Your children need to see you get worked up. You ain't got no energy. Some needs to light. Come on, baby, light my fire. You need that in your life. But whatever it is, man, my kids need to see that transformation and that change. The most powerful example you can show your children, I want you to see this. The most powerful example you can show them is that you allowed the Holy Spirit to transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. Your kids don't need you to be perfect. They need you to be a vessel that God works in. They need to see God work in you more than they need God to work through you to them. Do you understand this? If they could just see that God could change you, then they would believe that God could change them. What makes God real to us is watching God work in somebody around us, which is why I'm always telling you, it's never too late. You can be 76 and become a new person. And when you do, and people go, man, what's going on in you? The Holy Spirit got a hold of me. God is changing me and transforming me. That's what makes everything new and different. And then the last thing is this, and I ain't got time to preach on this. We out of time. Time's up. Got good news and bad news. The good news is there's a lot of time. The bad news is it's all up. The last thing you got to do is you got to maintain a healthy environment. 
It says, man, put it on your gates and your doorposts. Who is the gatekeeper of making sure your house is a healthy environment? Is it a healthy environment? Now, what's that mean? You know what it means. You know what it means. Just walk in the door and go, is this a healthy place? Is this a healthy place? <laughs> if I put a foster child in here, would it bring healing to them or would it screw them up further? Amen. Who's gatekeeping making sure it's a healthy environment? No, you know, in this house, we're not going to talk to each other like that. No, no, in this house, we ain't going to hide from the problems. No, 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 in this house, we're not going to throw our stuff out on the lawn. We're not going to slam the door. Nobody's going to punch the sheetrock. In this house, we're not going to be disrespectful. In this house, we're not going to get excited for no reason. In this house, we're going to pay the bills on time. In this house, we're not going to use credit cards to get ahead. In this house, we're going to give to the work of the Lord, and we're going to buy a little kid in Honduras an outfit for Christmas. Is it a healthy environment? Is it a healthy environment? What does that look like? How does that function? How does that operate? No, in this house, we're going to praise the Lord. In this house, we're going to go to church on Sunday. Yeah, but the Saints game's at 9. Yeah, and church is at 9. So which one are you going to pick? Who you want to worship? Spencer Rattler or the Lord Jesus Christ? No offense to Spencer. I'm sure he's a great guy. But he's a guy. He's a guy. No, the Lord comes first. All of us, we got to pick that out. You know, there's somebody that's not going to go to church today because the weather's nice. It ain't you. Praise the Lord. That's the way it goes. What's that look like? How's that function? How's that operate? How do we live? What does it mean? We got to decide. We want to make a difference to strengthen our families and to change the tide. Some of you, you've been given a blessing. Are you going to keep the blessing going? Or does the blessing end with you? Some of you, you've been given a curse. Is the curse going to be broken? Or are you going to keep it going? Sometimes we got to keep the blessing going. Sometimes we got to break the curse. And it's not enough just for you to get healing from your trauma. You got to change the whole trajectory of the environment after you so that the people that come behind you don't have trauma to heal too. Well, at least less. I want them to have trauma light. And it's not too late. Keep that in mind. It's not too late. Today is a great day to start. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. Our prayer leaders who are here are coming down to the front. Some of you might have messed up in life. Some of you might feel like, man, I don't know if I can turn this around. There's always hope. I need you to believe that. You got a choice, and your choice today could be, man, I need to ask the Holy Spirit of God to help me be new and different and to change the trajectory of my family and my environment. Some of you might not know where to start. It just starts with you asking God to forgive you and asking for his direction and his leadership and saying, man, I need to turn the tide and I need your help, Lord. Pray with me this morning. Dear Lord Jesus, forgive me. Heal me. Make me new. Let the old be gone and the new come. I need your help. I need your ministry. I need your healing. And I need you to help me change the trajectory of my family. I want to be a difference maker in my family. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's give the Lord some praise this morning. 
Thank you, Pastor Manley, for that great word. We're going to get ready to close. I want to encourage you afterwards to go visit Julissa and the table right here in the four. You can sign up with them there. Also, we're going to be having a baptism right after service. So if you want to stick around and celebrate a brother getting baptized, uh, that's going to be happening right afterwards. And also, if you have any prayer needs at all, maybe you want to come pray for your children. That's not a bad thing to do. We encourage you, matter of fact, to come and do that before you leave today. So let's go ahead. Let's pray. We'll dismiss service. But before you leave, come get the prayer that you need today. All right, let's pray. God, thank you so much uh, just for a great Sunday, Lord. I'm so thankful for the people here right now. I'm so thankful for this house, for this place, for this family. Lord, I pray you would bless everyone as they go this coming week. Help us to be the Christians, the parents, the husbands, the wives, the children, the people that you have planned for us and called us to be. Lord, we love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you all. We love you guys.